The low budget comedy F The Prom was released direct to video in 2017, allowing anybody with 12 bucks on an iTunes gift card to digitally download this highly anticipated first film from the Fine Brothers, who were at the time best known for branding a highly popular format of YouTube video with titles such as kids react to so and so, teens react to such and such, or adults react to this and that. You've seen them. Unfortunately, F The Prom was not quite as well received, with many reviewers sensing a disconnect between the movie's crass comedy style and the Fine Brothers' typically more wholesome and family-friendly YouTube content. However, I would argue that this movie makes perfect sense as an extension of the React brand, since it leaves audiences wanting everyone on screen to react the entire movie but with a better performance. You may also want the Fine Brothers to rewrite the entire script, or maybe just have the production company rethink their assumption that Benny and Rafi Fine are in any way plugged in to what young audiences want to sit and watch for 90 minutes other than like nine of their 10 minute YouTube videos. So settle in while this adult reacts to a movie that adds nothing to the formulaic underdog high school story except for a lower production value with a higher rate of harmful stereotypes per minute, out of touch web 2.0 teen dialogue, and a firestorm of profanity-heavy humor, too immature for adults, too mature for young adults, and too toxic if you are breastfeeding, pregnant, or plan to become pregnant. Although don't worry about that last one, because after this masterclass in awful cinema ruins your faith in humanity, procreation will likely be the last thing on your mind. So go ahead and suck that IUD back up into your body and stand as close as you want to the microwave. Then remind yourself that there's just nothing left here for the next generation in today's existentially disheartening installment of Clip Breakdown. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web, and we bust it into pieces like a pick me teenager who just wanted one night to feel special before graduation, and we say, sorry lady, maybe freshman year will turn out better because we're looking at each individual clip and deciding if that is getting the prom queen crown or if it's the beauty queen in tears, a la Lord and Mama. That's what was streaming down my face after watching this movie, which I think was recommended to me back in like 2021, and I didn't get around to watching it till uh, just now. I'm aware of the Fine brothers, Benny and Raffi Fine, for creating the React series, and then later entering a little bit of controversy that put their YouTube channel into a downward slump when they tried to trademark the React format and license it out to other channels, even though reacting to videos on YouTube was certainly not their invention. They they just kind of marketed the title and you can't trademark the word react. People react to this, people react to that. Like, I don't know, didn't work out for them. But before any of that happened, they were trying to make movies happen. And I just think that writing a movie and setting a bunch of random kids up to watch Lady Gaga videos is a different craft. I'm sorry if that's controversial, seems obvious to me. But I find the most egregious error that this film makes is trying to be formulaic in its structure. It's a story we've all heard before. The underdogs try to ruin the the big event for the popular kids who make their lives miserable, like that's Harriet the Spy, among other movies. But they try to stand apart by being overly crass and using a lot of blue humor to the point where you're like, oh no, no, oh no. That wasn't funny, it was just shocking. And as we know from some of the other people on YouTube, that doesn't age well. And this is not an old movie, it's 2017. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want me to cover even more movies by YouTubers like this. But most importantly, if you're new here, I would so appreciate you clicking that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, turn on notifications, and you'll always be the first to know when I'm asking you to the prom and then standing you up because you're Josie Grossy. Anyway, our main character in this is Cole. He's played by an actor. Like, that's the other thing. This movie had not nobodies as actors. This is the kid who was the main character in Super 8, that J.J. Abrams movie that I happen to like despite all of the distracting lens flares, but I haven't seen that kid in a lot of things since then. So here we are. His dad is trying to let him know like on his first day of freshman year, like you gotta be the popular kid. That's the best. That's what I was. And it's like, oh God, dad. 
star quarterback, prom, prom king, king, class, class vice, vice president, president, all the glory, none of the responsibility. responsibility. I know, Dad, I've heard it a thousand times before. So, do you guys live in the same compound where Osama bin Laden was killed, or do you just use the same landscaper? I get that this was a low-budget movie, but it would have cost absolutely nothing to remove that stack of bricks and broken concrete from the main character's front yard on the very first shot that we see. Or, they could have at least adjusted the framing of the shot, so it doesn't look like our upper middle class main characters live inside of a home with a dirt floor. Just a fun idea that I had after getting distracted by all of the dusty rubble in the background. Ground. Anyway, so the dad's a tool, but Cole, the main character, goes next door to his BFF Maddie's house where she's waiting to ride bikes. I see the director slash art department slash costume designers attempt at really showing the way that these kids age in the time jump between freshman year and senior year. Maddie particularly is dressed a lot more immature now and even her as an actress. She, this is the girl from Starstruck on Disney Channel. You can tell even she's trying to like make her voice sound more immature chore in this first scene, which like kudos to you, sweetheart, but the time jump was still ill-conceived. Let's get into it. Ready? As I'll ever be. Cole, stop trying to peek at Maddie's nipples. Oh my God, Dad. Dad, stop embarrassing me by sexually harassing the girl next door and her 14-year-old nipples. Sorry, Maddie, I swear, we tried to have him chemically castrated, but I think we used the wrong chemicals because now he's even more horny for girl nips. In order to sell this as like a super bad style raunchy teen comedy, the screenplay continuously tries to position Cole's dad as though he's like a horn dog who wants his son to lose his virginity. However, they actually make him seem like a full on child predator with a Chuck E. Cheese costume in his closet. Sir, do not cross that property line or we will activate the shock collar for pit bulls that we've had wrapped around the base of your penis. This town has really bad criminal justice infrastructure, obviously. Maddie expresses nerves about first day of high school, which is what this is. Cole's like, well, you'll always have me at school and next door. And I'm like, you cannot shoot me with a foreshadowing gun and have it bleed out more gruesomely than that. I feel like I'm gonna talk about death a lot tonight. Buckle up. Anyway, Cole is, um, he's the guy everybody, every girl wants, except if they can't see it because they're dumb and popular. And he even draws pictures for them. Uh -huh. Oh, hey, hold on. So good. You've really captured how my bike is always floating into the air and how I have no knees. Cole is like, yeah, I also gave you a Cindy Lou Who nose and flabby wobbly arms. Again, I recognize the director slash art department was probably trying to show how Cole's raw artistic talents further improve after the time jump to the end of high school. So take note of that, sure. It's still hard for me not to laugh seeing him give the girl he likes this mechanical pencil ass looking drawing that also has a caption explicitly calling her a loser. Like, I would stop talking to you for the rest of high school too, dumb and we never get that much of a visual representation that the two of them are losers. And then as you'll see, Maddie moves on in popularity. Uh, like we could have had the mean girl that we see later played by Madeline Pesh from Archie Rundale, Riverdale. She could have been like, you guys are stupid or whatever. Someone could have made them feel bad about themselves. The point is basically the second we get into this school, the new high school, two minutes into the movie, somebody comes up and pantses Cole and he becomes known as tidies, tidy whiteies, whatever his stupid nickname is. Every kid who's bullied in this school is just like the result of them having one embarrassing moment. The rest of the kids base a fake nickname off of. It's like, that's a little simple. Don't you think? That's not the only way kids experience harassment, but it is in this one. Anyway, his pants get pulled down after Maddie leaves him and she's like, oh my God, and then runs off. I think they need to give more significance to how basically right when high school starts, a rift starts forming between them with Maddie being the cool girl and Cole being the loser boy. Like what if young Marie Marissa, which is the name of the girl played by Madeline Pesh, is like pulling her away and she's maybe a loser too. And it shows that Maddie's association even helped Marissa get more popular. But also Maddie's like, I'll talk to you later, okay. But she's all clearly a little embarrassed. It would show how everybody starts to undergo their transformation. It would ease me into it more than just them going three and a half years later. In the very next scene, Cole is a new person with all new friends and so is Maddie. It's like, okay. Cole is talking to his friend who her name is, 
God, what are the names in this? It's so dumb. Oh, her name is Felicity. People call her City, even though they don't. Why do you need two nicknames as a character? Because her last name is Stuff, but people call her Stuffs. You'll see why. It's because she stuffed her bra, but the n last name Stuffs and Stuffed, like those are the, t they mean the same thing. It's just different tenses. So let's, this nickname sucks. This nickname sucks. That's all I can tell you. Anyway, City, Felicity, Stuffed, McTuff is like, oh God, here comes those girls. They're the popular girls, Maddie and Marissa, now known as the M&Ms. The M&Ms are an inspiration. The M&Ms are goddesses. The M&Ms are called that because their first names are Maddie and Marissa, which starts with an M. <laughs> Wow, that was an ambitious shot. But I think the filmmakers pulled it off. That's right, they somehow managed to combine the world's most unnatural blocking and the world's worst line deliveries on screen in a single take. We have the expositional dialogue directed at nobody. The cheerleaders pretending not to hear it even though they're two feet away, giving their fiercest hot girl Holloway walks. Then us in the audience actually not hearing it because the first girlies clearly weren't anywhere near the boom mic. <laughs> Great job, Stephanie, no one. But it still kind of sounds like you're just projecting inside of a big empty school hallway. Let's take it again, only this time, try projecting like you're inside of an otherworldly realm that you were sucked into by a haunted television. Back to one. We're home, baby, we're home. Can you find a way home to it? The M&Ms are goddesses. Gotta just stay away from the light. Listen, it's by now a well-established trope where the popular kids are introduced by walking slow motion down the hallway and then we see everybody else's reaction that further cements how cool they are. We saw it in Mean Girls. We saw it everywhere. But th this is not how you shoot and edit that together. This was shot like they didn't have time to execute it properly. Like they just had to get one shot. They couldn't take it again for better sound. They couldn't have those girls come in and re-record their sound. To me, it's like we need a straight on dolly shot following the girls down the hallway in a high frame rate so you get that slow motion and then you have cutaways to the people in the lockers who all were like this and they're like, oh, they're called the M&Ms because my is on fire or whatever he said, I wasn't listening. So yeah, we'll get a few more kind of what I would describe as less professional moments in this otherwise relatively professional looking film. They try to sell for us a lot of other things too, like how the other kids in the school, such as this girl with the glasses as a vlogger. She's made fun of because everyone's like, uh, Tig, uh, Tigs. I can't remember why her screen name is Tigs. I think because she was sweating in like tire stripes. I, I don't know. The nicknames are so confusing. Either way, she gets mad and abruptly yells at the whole class, but it's like so glossed over that you're like, why even include that? And then because it's the Fine Brothers who come from YouTube, I guess a lot of these kids were in the Teens React videos and we have other YouTubers making cameos as well. Could you please focus on something other than making your peers hate them themselves. Now go ahead and take out your phones and use them in ways your parents and I will never understand. Ma'am, you are roughly eight years older than these actors playing your students. So you have more in common with them than you ever will with their parents, no matter how big your blazer is or what kind of Heidi hairstyle they have you wearing. In case you didn't watch YouTube in the early 2010s, that is Lily Singh. She was ranked the number one highest earning female YouTuber by Forbes magazine the year that this movie came out, which I guess was enough validation at the time to get movie roles and even host a late night show without, you know, ever having to take an acting class or learn to be funny. Please note that we're not gonna fly through the Bermuda Triangle because things mysteriously disappear there. In fact, that's probably where your education went. By the looks of it, a lot of you are happy to be here too. <laughs> it's, it's mostly the brown people because this was free to attend. And without AI, we wouldn't have spell check. Can you imagine what our text conversations would look like? <laughs> it would be a duckin' nightmare. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I got bored there, so I just started organizing my laxatives for the week. Let's see, if I take two right now, then another two in an hour, perfect. Yep, that should cause severe dehydration and kill me. I believe in science. You know, people often ask me Narwhal. By the way, my legal name is Narwhal. I just thought I would tell you right now. They say Narwhal. Do you ever get tired of watching such boring or crappy content? And I say no because I'm different and better, but also because I prioritize healthy sleep. With the help of my amazing mattress from Helix Sleep, the sponsor of today's video, Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and shipped right to your door. I've had this mattress for almost a year now and I am amazed by how well it's held up and also by how great my sleep has been. As a side sleeper, I like like a medium firm mattress, but I'm always on like one side of the bed and Helix took all of that into consideration. They know that every 
everybody's body is different, so they made a sleep quiz that helps me enter my sleep preferences, whether I work with a sleep partner, work with, whether I sleep with a sleep partner, only sometimes, but I, I enter my body type and my preferences, and they helped match me with the Helix Midnight Luxe. Also, I run very hot, especially at night, so I upgraded to the Glaciotex cooling cover. It keeps me feeling cool and comfortable while I sleep. And frankly, since I got this mattress a year ago, I believe last June, I'm waking up feeling more energized. I don't have the shoulder and neck pain that I honestly struggled with every day beforehand. And even if I like do feel tired and I take a nap, I can take a 20 minute nap and feel completely refreshed. I fall asleep faster, so all of that is thanks to my Helix mattress, I am sure of it. The best part is Helix will deliver your mattress for free within the US right to your door. It comes rolled up in this box and it's super fun and easy and quick to set up. I did it all by myself. My Pomeranian offered zero help. <laughs> if it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried yet, you can take comfort in Helix's 100 night sleep trial. That gives you more than three months to make sure that you love your Helix mattress. And then beyond that, Helix Sleep offers a 10 year warranty plus financing options and flexible payment plans so you don't have to compromise on getting the best sleep of your life, mama. I love my Helix mattress and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Helix Sleep. Their 4th of July sale is running right now. It's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep with 25% off a Helix mattress plus two free pillows. Click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash deramio to find out more about this limited time offer. And thank you, Helix Sleep. As it turns out, Cole, ever since a not being friends with Madison anymore, has still carried a flame for her and has posted really beautiful drawings on his Instagram that nobody else knows about. And, um... City is like, oh, why do you even think she's popular? And he's like, I'll tell you why. Her hairstyles. And it's like, ugh. Mm -mm. Every day since freshman year, Maddie's had a different hairstyle and posted a photo of every single one. I mean, some of those were just the same blowout with different headbands. She couldn't even make it through one week long montage without repeating looks. If you wanna do a different hairstyle every day, you gotta start getting creative and weird, girlfriend. I'm talking crazy hair day every day. Like Harper from Wizards of Waverly Place. That matchbox cars hanging from your head type of crazy. Or they could just write out this part of the script. I don't know, seems better. This is just one example where the movie reeks of being written by a grown man who has never once been a teenage girl and also doesn't use Instagram yet somehow felt confident enough to make those the main aspects of his screenplay. Because nothing sells a teen comedy like a story that feels a superficial, reductive, and unrelatable. That's why the newest young adult series coming to the CW is called Amelia Bedelia on Fleek. In episode one, Amelia Bedelia goes viral on TikTok by hashtag contracting HPV on camera. Everyone is making fun of City. Yeah, because her la- they call her Stuff when her last name is Stuffed with a T. Again, f this movie, but you know, that's a given. At lunch, she's like, well, I used to be one of those popular girls you hate, so I'm glad I'm not, and you, don't, you aren't mad that you met me. And it's like, okay, so she was a fallen angel from the popular group. I'm sure that'll be a riveting backstory. Anyway, if you thought my sense of humor was dry, don't even get me started on the Colorado River. Oh, you haven't heard? The Colorado River is drying up and we're all gonna die. Not to sound alarmist, but that's basically what's gonna happen. The Colorado River runs through seven states in the American West, and it actually provides power to 40 million people, both agricultural land and urban areas. They say one in 10 Americans is served by the power created from that river. So it's a problem that climate change and water overuse is really limiting how long we're going to have that as a natural resource. There's a historic drought that has led to a dry period that has lasted more than two decades. The facts don't lie. The amount of water being used far exceeds what's available. The reservoirs are drying up. Six out of seven states along the Colorado River have come up with plans to cut their water usage but California, where I live, is the lone holdout, also the biggest water user out of the bunch. And while California has offered its own plan to cut water usage, it's tough when there are conflicting approaches. It brings up really hard to answer questions, like how do we provide water to fast growing cities, as well as to agricultural producers who need it to grow our food. Plus, do we recognize the fact that some parties established for a long time should
should get priority over new cities or new developments being popped up, but that's not always what's happening. The point is, water conservation is an issue we all need to take seriously, and it's really important that we vote and try to get in elected officials who focus on or are extremely familiar with water conservation. If we don't have politicians who are willing to take bold steps to address the issue, then like, mama. It's curtains for us. That's what they should have made the live action Disney reboot of Little Mermaid about. Anyway, here are those fucking girls again. Hi Maddie! Oh my god, your hair looks great today, Maddie! Wow, that means a lot coming from the featured extra with a piece of f***ed up ribbon holding in her hair extension. That girl came to set and said, I'm ready for my close up! And the producers were like, you're really not actually, but all of the stylists are busy giving barrel curls to the actually somewhat famous actress. So go on, get out there, diva. Side note, I don't know why the cheerleaders are called the legals, like what? That's weird. The movie is trying to be like winky at like the sexualization of teens, and yet the writer, Benny Fine, just managed to sexualize teens the way that society normally does. Like there's no irony to it, it's just gross. Either way, Maddie and Marissa get into a little argument, and then when Maddie leaves the bathroom, she sees that Marissa is making out with her boyfriend, who obviously is the number one tool that a popular girl uses to maintain her status. So she runs home heartbroken because Marissa's like, you didn't think I was ever a good friend, did you? I just waited four and a half years to f***ing change my mind up. I'm like, okay, okay. That's when Marissa goes into full on villain girl mode where she's like unapologetically evil rather than having a character motivation that feels genuinely motivated by her lack of self esteem or something, but whatever, no vulnerability for the wicked. Maddie's parents are kind of like trying to be supportive, but they don't know what it's like to be popular because they let on that they were losers in high school, which is, you know, juxtaposed by Cole, whose dad was popular in high school, who is trying to cheer him up over a bad first day. And then that's when they see Maddie go outside and cry on her car tail thing. <laughs> I know this is inappropriate, but I bet that girl's killer in the sack. You're right, because you seem more like a killer and then hide her body in a sack type of dad. Which is why all of Cole's parent-teacher conferences are conducted via email after the first time they meet you. Did no one involved with this production have any feedback for the Fine Brothers on the casual way that this character sexualizes the young girl next door? Because I promise you, it's not fine, brothers. These are the same people responsible for YouTube videos like Kids React to Old Computers and Kids React to Rotary Phones. How about Kids React Appropriately to Behavior That Makes Them Feel uncomfortable by telling a trusted adult, even if it means mom or dad might get in trouble. Actually, I can see why that wouldn't have a great click-through rate on YouTube, but it should still at least be the subtext of the messaging, rather than, oh, my dad, the horny dad criminal. Cole goes out and comforts the girl, Maddie, and she's like, oh, why did we ever stop talking? And it's like, I don't know, because they didn't bother to show it on screen. Although, they do go into a quick flashback where it shows Maddie, like I said, should have happened at the top, being popular, getting that popular boyfriend, that Madeline Pesh girl pulling her away before Cole can say hi, but it's like they never spoke again. There could have been a little argument about their difference in goals with the social status, like him kind of dismissing her desire to be popular and her digging her heels in, but no. Either way, this one conversation is enough for Maddie to be like, oh my God, you know what? I'm gonna tag you in this picture, which is something I've never done for anyone ever, because it would be an instant boost to their popularity. Cole, come on, we're taking a selfie. <laughs> what, no. Yeah, come on, let's go. <laughs> Never done that before. You've never had your picture taken? Are you like Amish on your mom's side of the family or something? Because I always see your dad taking candid shots of me through my bedroom window. And has he not also offered to shoot your modeling portfolio inside the basement? Do we really think someone Cole's age has never taken a selfie? Having had access to an iPhone with Snapchat filters since age 12? At the very least, he seems like the kind of kid who draws anime style self portraits where he has the body of a muscular dolphin, which is just like a different kind of selfie and he can sell them at conventions for whatever kink community being a sexy dolphin falls under. Seconds after posting the photo, all of the whole school is following what's his name because she's that popular. But Cole doesn't want to be popular, so he doesn't want people to see his drawings and he deletes his account. That's when Maddie is like, why did this have to happen for prom? And Cole's like, well, because prom is the most important day. Everyone wants the best memories ever to be right at graduation. And she's like, let's ruin it for them. And he's like, okay. 
And that's the first act, folks. Oi, the kids are gonna ruin the prom. They start by trying to enlist City into the whole plan. She's reluctant at first. Hey, what do you mean, no way? You hate them all worse than I do. I'm just not that riled. Besides getting revenge on the popular kids, that's like bullying from our side. At first, I was wondering what sort of action got cut from this scene that would explain those kids setting up a medical triage unit on the floor of the background. I think the script originally included all of these promposals that went awry, which was a trend topic at the time because we were all reading and stupid shit like BuzzFeed. Cancelled subplot aside, I'm actually left with a more pressing question, which is what are these two conventionally attractive, all-American main character teens getting bullied over? Maybe if they found some actually weird or ugly classmates to target and continued the cycle of bullying like they're supposed to, then the popular kids would leave them both alone. But no. Felicity is like, let's face it, I'll always be an outcast. I'm pretty, cool, and I have the toned stomach of a pop star. But as long as I'm wearing this shoelace like a necklace, he'll always see me as a freak. Okay, sweetie, you carry that narrative with you all the way to Hollywood fame. But then that boy that cheated on Maddie comes up and is like, excuse me, your name is has a T in it when it doesn't or whatever. And she's like, okay, you know what? I'm in. If you're expecting any of the parents to be good role models in this movie, they aren't, nor is the principal here. I've been fielding complaints from the juniors about the amount of time I spend discussing the senior prom. I say, get a senior to take you. It's only statutory if you get caught. A lawyer for the Fine Brothers was like, at this point, can you just write in one line for any character that doesn't actively promote having uh, relations with minors? And the Fine Brothers were like, uh, no, actually. We can't think of a single thing like that. Isn't that funny? Yes, it is. I mean, hypothetically, if any joke in this movie were going to be funny, it would be the one that you couldn't think of. Yes, I understand semantics, Benny and Raffi Fine. I'm your an imaginary lawyer in this conversation that never happened. Maddie runs into Marissa in the bathroom and Marissa's like, um, you wouldn't have even been popular if it weren't for me and you never would have gone out with this boy that I stole from you. I hadn't gotten the other girl out of the way and texted him to come into the gym. It's like, what? That's a lot of telling a story that isn't showing a story. Shut the f up. So redoubling on her efforts to get back at Marissa and her ex-boyfriend, Maddie and City and Cole get to work on their plan of ruining prom while also bonding in the meantime, taking selfies forever. They realize that the only way they can get help with this plan is to target help from the people whose lives were made miserable by the popular kids. They all suck. I'll just run through them. There's Ephraim with the nickname Strings because he's Jewish and everyone is an anti-Semite at this school. There's Larry, AKA Sweats. He has a glandular issue and he sweats a lot. So funny. Abby slash Tiggs is the one who, what? oh, she had nude photos of her distributed across the classroom. Room, which to me is like, that's a huge issue, but they treat it like it's funny. There's Emil, AKA Muty, who his voice cracked in class a few times and that became his whole personality so he doesn't talk anymore. Also disgustingly spiky hair, Josh Groban. And then finally TJ with no nickname. He is the victim of rampant homophobia. He got caught hitting on a guy in the locker room. Everyone ostracized him. And then even the gay kids ostracized him. So he doesn't fit in anywhere because he's too much of a jock to be gay and too gay to be a jock. Must be hard passing as straight. Once again, these characters were clearly written by somebody who has no clue. Gay stereotypes should only be written by gay writers because we sort of invented stereotypes. It's something we're very proud of. First of all, the four of those gays snapped completely out of sync for a less sassy result, which would only happen if one member of the group was wearing a strong fragrance, which would interfere with our ability to transmit snapping in sync pheromones. And that wouldn't make sense because gay people haven't worn cologne since 2015 when we started getting turned on by body odor. Secondly, these gays are shunning a fellow gay because he's wearing an athletic uniform, as though gays aren't single-handedly keeping the jockstrap companies in business while remaining the number one fetishists of toxic masculinity. So there. Oh no, my snaps were out of sync, which for a gay person means I probably have rabies, like when you see a raccoon during the daytime. So after being shunned and the victim of a dildo prank, TJ then goes on to like hit on all of the straight guys that he ever encounters, but then being like, sorry, you're too femme for me and it's like isn't that the same exact thing that the other guys were ostracizing you for whatever whatever F you that kid was in Degrassi the next generation anyway the kids are all convinced to be a part of the team because they aren't into it at first but then someone is mean to them and they're like okay we're in it's like this feels very 
and familiar every single minute. Meanwhile, the principal is like, Maddie, dear, you don't want to be friends with the losers. I was popular and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I'm just thinking like, this better have a point in the overall plot, but it doesn't. Maddie goes over to Cole's house. She's impressed with his comic book art skills. By the way, he previously wasn't planning to go to prom because the school he's hoping to get accepted into was having an art gallery showing for all of the prospective students. So it would have been like his foot in the door. But you know, Maddie's convincing him to forget that and go to prom and they catch up watching geeky movies like they did as a kid. So apparently part of the plan was for Maddie and Cole to go to prom as friends. He prom poses with a big cardboard cutout. That's coming at the same time that Marissa's boyfriend that she stole from Maddie is like, this isn't working, I gotta go. And he breaks up with her and she's jealous now because Cole is becoming popular by being associated with Maddie via Instagram. My throat hurts from talking about this stupid shit. Oh my god, he's totes hot. I am totally voting for them for prom king and queen. No, I didn't say it until now, but I totally shift them. Why don't you say totally a couple more times, adult women playing teenagers? Like, who wrote this? Benny Fine did. Directed by Raffi Fine. Both of you can go to jail. Anyway, the Jewish student is not allowed to touch girls, not even Tiggs, who is clearly into him, and she's also Jewish, which makes this a match made in heaven, according to this movie. Marissa then goes and tries to hit on Cole and steal him away from Maddie. It's like, girl, you were pathological. Tries to ask him to prom, and he's like, no way. Then Maddie's ex-boyfriend comes up and uh, makes fun of City. Oh, and that's when City tells Maddie like, oh, he was my boyfriend before he left me to get to you. And Maddie's like, you're the one that Marissa got rid of to be with me? And she's like, yeah, I thought you knew that. And then it goes into the flashback about how City got her nickname of Stuffs where she was basically tricked into stuffing her bra with tissue and it was super embarrassing and never ever was anything the same. He wouldn't be with her anymore. It's dumb. Never in my life have I met somebody where one mildly embarrassing experience like that would cause them to be outcast for the rest of their high school career, especially when they're hot already. But whatever, all the outcasts are at Cole's house making the plans happen with blueprints. There's no part of the plan that requires blueprints, but whatever, I guess this is home alone now too. The dad comes in, he still sucks. Dude, when your balls drop. This is why I could never be an actor. As soon as the director was like, mm, make it look like you're checking out that teenage girl's ass before you speculate about the other teenage boy's genitals. I would walk right off that set. Like there's no way I'm doing that on camera. Just to allow any idiot with the internet to take a clip of it out of context and then cause everyone to think that I am a pervert. Watch. I am a pervert. See how easy that was? I am my own idiot with the internet. I am a pervert. No, I am a pervert. Pervert. Uh, why was I even playing around with that in GarageBand? I don't know what happens next. Oh, Maddie and him kiss. And then when Maddie gets home, her parents who were losers are like, everyone wants to have a good time at prom. Even we did as losers. But some guy made us into the jokes of the whole thing because he called our names for prom king and queen and then said psych. I'm like, that that's the best you could come up with? The, the arc defining incident for those two parents? Alrighty. There's random other moments that don't m really matter. Like the kid they call strings, he's like, I can't do anything on the Shabbat on Saturday. So Tiggs is like, I'll do it. And she gets his uncle to cancel all of the prom limos, which I thought would play into it bigger, but it doesn't. She then goes and turns up like the temperature on Marissa's tanning bed. And so it's the night of the prom. We see Marissa's now a little bit sunburned. It's like, oh, good sabotage. They think that because Marissa wants to go to the prom with Cole now, if he accepted, he would be able to like get in her Maddie's revenge even more. But so he's about to leave and pick up Marissa and she calls and is like, even though she's going to the prom now with the boyfriend that I stole originally, but they're back together. And that's when he's like, what? I didn't know that. Cause he thought she was just gonna sit out the prom. But after her conversation with her parents, Maddie was like, everyone wants to go to the prom. I just have to go. So Cole runs out and confronts her and she's like, sorry, okay, I'm just a girl and I need to go to prom like every other girl biologically needs to. Yeah, it's cliche, but I don't care. Everything about high school is cliche. Especially the part about the popular girls being human garbage fires. Also the part where you're drunk driving through North Carolina with your three best friends and then you hit an old fishing boat worker and dump his body into the ocean. But then soon there's a killer dressed like a fishing boat worker and he's hunting you down one by one with a metal hook. And then suddenly your whole life life is a thrilling whodunit slasher and you have a best friend named Helen Shivers. Like what are you, what, now you're just talking everyone, shut the f 
oh, I hate the prom. I guess the real kickoff of the whole plan is like, oh, we canceled all of these limos, so now the kids have to take taxis to prom. It's like, mama. In my school, very few people took a limo to prom. We were like, car will do. Inside, Cole is like, it, I'm not going to prom. This is so stupid. Maddie's not even gonna go with me. She's going with her boyfriend. She doesn't want to do the plan anymore. She's like, just leave me out of the plan. And then the dad comes in and is like, you have to do this plan. I found your blueprints and I was so mean at my prom. And it flashes back to the fact that he was the mean guy who made Maddie's parents feel bad. And then he moved into the house next to them so he could continue to torment them. And it's like, what? Okay, origin story of a lunatic. You moved into that house so that you could stalk their teenage daughter, be real. But but he's like, everything would be better if someone had ruined my prom and not let me grow up to be an who your mom left. And it's like, aw, I assumed his mom had died. So he convinces Cole to go to the prom and carry out the plan, which involves hacking the app where they're all voting for prom king and queen. I'm like, this is literally Mean Girls now. Fine brothers, you think I didn't see it? Also, they hack the gay kids and the straight kids who ostracized him and makes the straight kids think that each other are gay and the gay kids think that they're all Trump supporters. I was like, okay, this was not well thought out. Then Strings hijacks the slideshow to start showing these pictures that are embarrassing of all the popular kids who tortured him, including one that like shows the kid's fake penis. And it's like, that's really uncomfortable. It's like they show an actual bulbous material that doesn't look like a penis. It's like, what is this? If this seems like a really problematic plot point, it is. And they make sure to acknowledge that several times throughout the rest of the movie in String's character arc. You realize you're probably gonna get arrested for distributing porn, right? You're gonna be on the sex offender list for the rest of your life, kid. I'm on the sex offenders list indefinitely. Oh, this must be the character that's based on the real life Benny and Rafi Fine from high school. Not because of the Jewish thing, because of the other thing they just kept repeating. Sidney's ex-boyfriend slash Maddie's ex-boyfriend slash Marissa's ex-boyfriend is about to get called onto the stage along with Maddie, who for some reason, I don't know when they decided this, but they were like, we're not gonna hack Marissa to win so that we can literally do the thing from Carrie, also from Degrassi with Rick. Where, because it's not pig's blood, it's tarring and feathering him. So City distracts the ex-boyfriend and is like, I just wanted my last memories of you to not be, of you being an asshole. And it's like, why, where did this come from? You didn't care about him for the last three and a half years and all of a sudden. But Maddie gets up on stage and then, uh oh, they pour the tar and the feathers on her. And then the sweaty kid gets his revenge by pulling the fire alarms. He's like, now you all know how it feels to be wet. And it's like, they've showered before. So each kid gets like a specific form of revenge on the whole class. And as everyone's running out to the parking lot, Cole gets pantsed yet again. After Maddie is like, you're such a jerk for doing this to me. Like, and he's like, I didn't have anything to do with it. And she's like, I didn't have anything to do with it. And it's like, you should just roll the credits. I didn't even do anything. You never do anything, which is exactly why guys like Kane think it's okay to torment us. You stay their friend. You go to their parties. You become their girlfriend or boyfriend. Wait, Maddie is gender fluid? Yes. We stand, you sticky human, we stand. Finally, Cole has had enough. He stands up in front of the whole crowd pantsless and is like, why are we doing this? We have been bullying each other for generations and we have to finally stop. It's like, I made it through high school without bullying anybody. Actually, let me not die on that hill, but bullying was not a big part of my story. I'll say that much, I'm not perfect. I was probably mean to people at times, but that's because kids are trying to work out their emotional regulation. The point is, I'm generally, I tried to be nice and most of the people that I interacted with did too. And those who didn't, I forgive because because they were stupid kids. But I guess Cole gives such a rousing speech about being like, can't we just all be nice to each other? We have all of this technology, oh, where we, and instead of bringing us together, it's tearing us apart. It's like not these 30 something year old adults demonizing cell phones through the mouths of a teenager who would never demonize cell phones because they grew up native to them. Whatever, everyone else is like, yeah, prom suck. Say the title name. So yeah, we ruined your night. So what? We didn't shoot up the school. None of us committed suicide. Well, somebody better do something because this movie is almost over and it's boring as f Oh, no, that came out wrong. Yay, healthy gathering of high schoolers. Then everyone agree with him. Yeah, f the prom. F the prom. Yeah, f the prom. Okay, whatever, but did you notice how all of your teachers and chaperones just disappeared as soon as the fire alarm went off? All you little shits are yelling f the prom, but the people who are in charge of you are like, no, f you children, you can rot in hell. Anyway, Tiggs and Strings kiss before he's carted off to jail. Marissa is about to like be like, okay, whatever, we can be friends to the sweaty guy, but then she's like, I'm sorry, I can't. So she hasn't learned her lesson. Maybe the sequel, but the other featured extra girl does dance with him and uh, City gets back together with that guy who left her because he felt pressured into it by a society of teenagers. 
I guess they've carried that love through all of those years of growing apart. Teenagers do not do this, whatever. So Maddie is trying to make up with Cole and he's like mad still. I forget at this point why, but he like takes a picture of her and he's like, another unfiltered moment. And she's like, oh. He rips off his art school poster for the gallery thing he missed because he ruined his shot and blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, the next day, Cole completely tries to avoid her at school and she feels so bad that she goes over to his house when he's not home and he, she like asks to find out about this art school he was trying to get accepted into. So something's up her sleeve, her yellow billowy sleeve when she has the graduation gown on. All the kids are graduating. City is like, so you got into art school? And he's like, yep, I'm leaving today. And it's like, that's very soon. You didn't even finish graduating yet, but okay. And then he still blows off Maddie. And that's when City is like, don't you know, she's the one who sent your portfolio into that art school. And I'm like, so he got accepted into art school that he had already been a prospective student of just months before graduating, like weeks before graduating. Wouldn't this have been a year earlier? I hate this movie. And the Fine brothers clearly don't know anything about high school. It says that Benny Fine never went to high school. He was homeschooled. So this is just his fabricated interpretation of what it is, which is, I would believe. But regardless, the next day or that day, I guess, Cole gives Maddie a comic book that he made especially for her about their love story. And it ends with him saying, I love you. And she's like, is that just part of the story? And he's like, no, I really do. So they kiss and she's like, all right, when are you going to school? Will we have the summer together? And he's like, no. And also things got so intense between us so quickly. I think my best of we were just friends. Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, probably, but that doesn't make it a satisfying ending to this movie. Maddie could not help but be gagged by that a bit. She said, Oh! Maddie, sweetie, I know that was unexpected and you must be hurt, but remember, you're young and gorgeous and he's just Ken. If it were me, I would be like, okay, see you Thanksgiving break, friend, knowing full well that he's gonna change his tune as soon as he finds out that I've been letting his creepy dad hit it ever since July. But I was a teenage demon baby, so don't take anything I say as actual advice. And I guess that was their way of subverting the expectations where like in the end, they did just remain friends and they rode their bikes like at the beginning. And it's like, they can ride those bikes right into a river and float down to the ocean. I don't care one bit because that's all they wrote for F the prom. And I say F the movie, F the prom. This was so boring and cliche and bad, but that's only when it wasn't horrible and awful and alarming and gross. So let me know if you had a similar impression or if you saw this movie in 2017, five years ago when it came out, six years. Let me know in the comments below. Also give this video a big thumbs up once again, if you wanna see YouTuber clip breakdowns like this and let me know what other ones in the comments there are. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm not being your girlfriend, but I am being your friend. And I'm also riding your dad's Oops. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive watch parties and bonus episodes. So check it all out, baby. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for tarring and feathering the hot girl at prom with me today. I will see you next time. <laughs>